The single most powerful and probably painful memory of my 30 years in business was the day that I sat down with my co-founder of an early company and uh, had the conversation that we needed to part ways. And I'll never forget it because that was the day that I learned the true power of culture, the rocket fuel of companies, but I also realized that culture can be just as damaging as it can be enabling. Fast forward to uh, 2011, and my company, Silverpop, uh, had done really well. We'd grown to $60, $70 million. We were executing relatively well. We had a great team, a great product, tons of cash, and yet we had kind of lost our momentum. We were at risk of not being everything we could be. And so I, again, learned the power of culture, and I'm going to share the story that followed up with Silverpop, because within the next year, we applied several different approaches. We got the culture re-energized, uh, re-sparked the growth in the company, and ended up selling it to IBM last year. So the story had a very happy ending. So a quick primer on staging. Um, now, I've seen a lot of different company growth. I've uh, been a CEO of three different companies, one of 60, uh, 500, even 3,000 person company. I've taken the company public. I've been a venture capitalist with Greylock. Um, I've sat on dozens of boards and bought 30 plus companies. So I've had the opportunity to see scale play itself out in many different ways. In fact, I'm kind of passionate about the science of scaling companies. And now I'm the VP of strategy at IBM, so I get to look across this entire giant company at IBM worldwide, 450,000 people, and think about the scale and how we can organize and grow that company. So I'm going to focus today on small companies. Uh, three kinds of small companies, and I call them family, tribe, and town. Now, how many of you are a part of a company under 25 people? And how many of you are under uh, 25 to 125? This is, okay, anyone over 125? All right, good. Well, I'm going to talk a lot about the tribes, the family stage, which is, it's an amazing stage, one of the funnest stages in a company because culture just works. Everyone's basically fighting for survival and trying to prove that what you want to create can work. You move to the tribe stage, and you have something that's working, and now you're trying to rev it up. You're building structure, repeatability. Uh, you want to be able to take this thing, get to the town stage where you press the accelerator, you inject a lot of resources, and you go to the stratosphere, you get a liquidity event, and you're a winner. So there's three ways that I have found that culture kills companies. Now, to be clear, there's lots of ways companies can die. Uh, you can die because your technology stinks, or because you don't have a market, or because a competitor just comes right in and takes over the marketplace. You could run out of money. But those are all worthy ways of dying. A terrible way of dying is implosion, which means basically you're dying for no other reason than you messed it up. That's a terrible way to go, and I'm going to give you the three things I've seen that happen to make that terrible outcome happen. The first is you do too much. Man, you got your product, it's going, it's jamming, people are starting to knock on your door, partners, investors, customers, things are coming in so fast you can't possibly deal with it. What happens? Communications break down, product quality plummets. You're toast. The second, it's the generalist to specialist cultural shift. Now, in a small company, in a family-sized company, everyone does everything. That's what makes it awesome. So maybe a new opportunity comes up, a bunch of people take on the new tasks, they go after it, they wear different hats, threat comes up, everyone moves over, they change their hats and their roles for a few weeks, they go focus on that, right? That's an amazing kind of person. I call them generalists. But as you grow and as you put structure in place, organization, you actually need these things called specialists. Turns out most generalists make lousy specialists. How many people heard of Robin Dunbar? Not a many. So this guy's an anthropologist. He looks at primates. And he uh, studied monkeys and apes and chimps, and he looked at all the different things and associated this particular size of the chimp's brain with the size groups that these apes formed. And he extrapolated to people, and it turns out that humans have a natural gathering size of 120 to 150 people. And that has been my own experience. It's actually very profound. Um, and you think about it another way, when you get past that threshold, all the natural trust, all the natural bonding and sense of camaraderie tends to fall apart. And most companies don't see it coming. And you hear comments like, well, it used to be really great around here, but it's lost its way. See, you know, we don't have a soul anymore. You hear all these comments. I've heard them over and over again. And if you don't know this one's coming, it's going to hit you in the head like a two by four. It's easy to plan for, though. But if you're a mathematician, just think about it this way. Every time you add a new person to your company, do a node diagram, the 
trust between any two people drops geometrically. Not linearly, geometrically. The more people you add into your company, trust drops geometrically. Get your head around that. So four tips to surviving. Uh, surviving is uh, relatively easy. I'm going to step through each one. Um, you know, I talked about my, uh, my colleague and my close friend at the very beginning. And uh, that conversation that I had with him about parting ways, you know, what was it that was going wrong culturally? Now, this is a guy that was a genius and a visionary and had blood, sweat, and teared his way to getting our company to a place where it was successful and relevant and in a position to get liquidity. What else could, be, what else could you ask? Well, it turns out that this was also a guy that when something needed to be done, he would jump in and get it done, you know, no matter what. He would roll up his sleeves and do it. Well, as we started putting people under him, he kept jumping in and doing it. And he, people would say, no, no, let me do it. That's why you hired me. He'd do it for him anyway. And worse yet, he'd say, not only, you know, if I'm going to let you do it, I want you to do it this particular way. And so we were actually less effective when he had a team than when he was by himself. And this is a, this is a cultural manifestation. So the, the people that make amazing founders and amazing early stage leaders, most of you, often struggle mightily when it comes to growing and organizing a structured company. Now, there's a couple times in business history where you have so much momentum, so much success. Out of the gate, you can rise right past 100, 200, 300 people and just keep going with the same original culture. But most companies aren't that lucky. In order to grow, you're going to have to seriously change. You have to pivot, in a sense, your culture. The CEO is a really interesting one, which is its own talk for another time. So for survival tip two, um, this, was, this may sound kind of trite. But in uh, 2011, uh, my company, Silver Pop, we were doing all the right things. You know, you go to the business school and you go to education. You're supposed to like have everyone write down their goals and you do this annually at a big brain session, brainstorming session, then everyone gets their assigned goals and then, you know, you, you do those things, right? Well, we had some of our executives with a dozen different goals. I had one executive with 25 goals. Guess how many of those goals she got done? I have no idea because about a quarter into it, there was so much noise and so much effort to keep track of all these goals, we just kind of went back in autopilot mode and do what most companies do. It's just boom, 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 go, right? So, and this wasn't working because we weren't able to get alignment across the team. So I launched in 2012 a new program, much more sophisticated than what I've got here. But basically, if you take away the idea, it's you got to have three things, just three things. Not four, not two, just three things that each person, particularly the CEO on down, is assigned to. This is an incredibly powerful process because it forces you to focus. It forces you to prioritize. Strategy typically emerges from this. And by the way, if I'm the CEO and there's four things I really, really want to get done, I have to delegate. So it forces delegation. There's so many secondary good effects to this simple process. And by the way, we did it every six months. You could do it every three months, every year, depending on your cycle time. This is a uh, powerful enabler. The third is to keep placing small bets. And most of you guys are in family-sized companies, so what you're doing every day is making small bets. You're iterating your products, you're testing new customers. But when you get to a, past a certain size, you want to put all your resources, pedal to the metal, grow, grow, grow. You want to put, because it's working. But this is one of the best books ever written, The Innovator's Dilemma. It was written for large companies, but I believe it applies to small companies just the same. Basically, you, if you have only a plan A, and you do it really well, something's going to come up from somewhere that you didn't expect It's probably going to kill you. So even in a small company that's struggling for resources, I created a group I called Emerging Apps, and I took two or three of my most entrepreneurial people, I had them report directly to me, I gave them a tiny little budget, and I said, you, the rules don't apply to you. Now, this is when I had just 500 people. I should have done it when I had 100. And they went out and iterated. You know what they did? In three months, they created the first product. In six months, they created a second product. Within one year, they were paying for themselves. Within a year and a half, this little tiny group, which annoyed everyone else in the company because the rules didn't apply to them, they were actually some of the number one reasons customers were picking our company. And when IBM acquired us, they're looking at this like, well, you didn't follow the code practices here, and how come this isn't consistent? You so said, what? Look at all the money coming in. We'll, 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 we can fix that stuff later, just like a startup. And, and the last survival tip, this is the one that's most important to me, and it's maybe the least obvious for most of you that are in an early stage. You've got to have a mission. Now, I bet every one of you has a killer mission. And, and the cool thing is, everybody has a mission, right? But it, until you've grown, it hasn't been tested. Because when you're a small family or even tribe-sized tribe company, the mission 
isn't going to make or break your culture. Just the fact that you're fighting to survive and find meaning is enough to build a culture. But when you get to town, when you get to that last stage, if you don't have a mission, your company's going to fall apart. Slow death. It's like a bleeding. The quality of the mission is, is not necessarily obvious, but the one requirement is that when you get to town stage and larger, you absolutely have to be religiously convicted to your mission. That is, uh, ben Horowitz in his book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, does it really well. He said, the power of a mission is it puts all the stuff you do every day and every quarter into context. If you have a fantastic product launch and you're in the front page of everything and the blogs are lighting up about you, the mission reminds you you still have a long way to go. Don't let it go to your head. If you have a terrible quarter, you're Mr. Numbers and your VCs are breathing down your throat, you're, it's not the end of the world because you still have the mission and missions take years to achieve. A mission puts everything in context. And by the way, one of the questions I get all the time is, well, what if my mission changes? Well, right down the street here, Salesforce.com, they are the masters of the mission because you go back and watch Salesforce.com, their first mission was no software. A couple years ago, it was social CRM, and then it was marketing cloud. I don't even know what it is right now. But the fact is, when you see Mark Benioff up on stage talking about what their mission is right now, you absolutely believe it, and so does every single person in his company because they live and breathe missions like no other company, and they have no apologies for changing them when the context changes. So let me wrap up with the greatest mission uh, statement ever. Because the test of a mission, well, the difference between a mission and a marketing statement is how, how much conviction you have. That's the difference. I don't think I've ever seen a mission statement with more conviction than the uh, Facebook IPO. We frequently make dis product decisions that may reduce our short-term revenue or profitability if we believe those decisions are consistent with our mission. That is, in the first couple pages, of their IPO document. How often do you see a mission commitment like that? At the bottom, and this is my favorite, I'm going to use this forever. Simply put, we don't build services to make money, we make money to build better services. This is, this is what a mission can do. So I have one more thing. Have you heard that before? Uh, I want to wrap up um, with a pretty interesting insight I had about a year ago. So I, when I joined IBM, I had this picture of IBM, right, 450,000 people, lots of people walking around in, in uh, sports jackets and working on mainframes, and mm, that was right. But the thing that actually surprised me, and one of the reasons I'm here today, is that um, IBM has an insane amount of energy towards taking all the things they've learned about scale and bringing it to startups. I, I had no idea. I'm from the startup community. I had no idea that IBM has smart camps and catalyst programs and is doing some amazing things with amazing companies to help transform them and scale them. So if you don't know the story, and I didn't know it, come by and say hi to the folks at IBM here. This is my commercial, but it's really worthwhile. The stuff that we're doing from Watson uh, to uh, the platforms we've got will probably blow your mind. Someone once said that uh, this isn't your father's IBM, it's not even your IBM, it's your kid's IBM. So it'd be worth taking a look if you have a few minutes. Thank you very much for your time today, everybody. Uh, so questions from the audience are coming in um, and great feedback. What are some strategies, tactics to build or reinforce the mission um, and make sure the culture is healthy? Do you have ways to test if a culture is healthy at a company? And what are some tactics to make it healthier? Uh, you know, one of the things that I found that works, if you have a mission and you want to test whether it's a really good one, um, I, I plant seeds with a mission, because missions don't just emerge. I wish I could go into my ivory tower when I've been CEO and come out with the grand mission, the stone tablets, and everyone says, yes, that's exactly what it is. I'm not that smart. Maybe you guys are. What I typically do is I, I, I do it collaboratively, and I do it iteratively. And so I'll put out an idea, and I'll talk to people. And it used to drive me crazy when I was early in my career, because I'd share an idea, and then it wouldn't go anywhere. And I'd say, oh, they're not listening. I wasn't listening. It didn't stick. I iterate just like a good product, and I iterate in the mission privately among people I trust, and then it starts to get sticky. Then it goes viral. When it goes viral, you've got the right mission. Be willing to test and try, and don't be afraid to change it. And um, what do you think the difference between a mission and a vision is? What is the difference between a mission and a vision? Wow. Um, a vision is, a, is an end state. It's what the world could be. And a mission is what you're going to do about it. Um, they're often confused, and I've done a lot of work on a lot of boards about them, and frankly, for all practical purposes, um, they're interchangeable. Um, I've seen some academic work on why they're different, but ultimately, a vision is something that talks about, you know, in the future, 
we're going to be running all clean energy and uh, the world's going to be a better place because we're not going to need fossil fuels. That's a vision. A mission is we are going to build a set of products um, that are going to help transform the world and achieve that vision. Awesome. On that note, let's hear it for Bill one more time. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, everybody.